Greetings and welcome to the audio Wikipedia, today's topic is Nanjing Massacre Episode 02. Battle of Nanjing Siege of the City The Japanese military continued to move forward, breaching the last lines of Chinese resistance, and arriving outside the city gates of Nanjing on December 9. Demand for Surrender at noon on December 9, the Japanese military dropped leaflets into the city, urging the city of Nanjing to surrender within 24 hours, promising no mercy if the offer is refused. In the meantime, members of the committee contacted Tang and proposed a plan for a three-day ceasefire, during which the Chinese troops could withdraw without fighting while the Japanese troops would stay in their present position. John Ray boarded the U.S. gunboat Panay on December 9 and sent two telegrams one to Chiang Kai-shek by way of the American ambassador in Hankou, and one to the Japanese military authority in Shanghai. Assault and Capture of Nanjing The Japanese awaited an answer to their demand for surrender, but no response was received from the Chinese by the deadline. On December 10, General Iwain Matsui waited another hour before issuing the command to take Nanjing by force. The Japanese army mounted its assault on the Nanjing walls from multiple directions. The SEF 16th Division attacked three gates on the eastern side, the 6th Division of the 10A launched its offensive on the western walls, and the SEF's 9th Division advanced into the area in between. On December 12, under heavy artillery fire and aerial bombardment, General Tang Xingqi ordered his men to retreat. What followed was nothing short of chaos. Some Chinese soldiers stripped civilians of their clothing in a desperate attempt to blend in, and many others were shot by the Chinese supervisory unit as they tried to flee. On December 13, the 6th and the 116th Divisions of the Japanese Army were the first to enter the city, facing little military resistance. Simultaneously, the 9th Division entered nearby Guanghua Gate, and the 16th Division entered the Zhongshan and Taiping Gates. That same afternoon, two small Japanese navy fleets arrived on both sides of the Yangtze River. Pursuit and Mopping Up Operations Japanese troops pursued the retreating Chinese army units, primarily in the Xiaquan area to the north of the city walls and around the Zijin Mountain in the east. Although most sources suggest that the final phase of the battle consisted of a one-sided slaughter of Chinese troops by the Japanese, some Japanese historians maintain that the remaining Chinese military still posed a serious threat to the Japanese. Prince Yasuhiko Asaka told a war correspondent later that he was in a very perilous position, when his headquarters was ambushed by Chinese forces that were in the midst of fleeing from Nanjing east of the city. On the other side of the city, the 11th Company of the 45th Regiment encountered some 20,000 Chinese soldiers who were making their way from Xiaquan. The Japanese army conducted its mopping up operation both inside and outside the Nanking safety zone. Since the area outside the safety zone had been almost completely evacuated, the mopping up effort was concentrated in the safety zone. The safety zone, an area of 3.85 square kilometers, was packed with the remaining population of Nanjing. The Japanese army leadership assigned sections of the safety zone to some units to separate alleged plainclothes soldiers from civilians. The number of Chinese soldiers in plain clothes that were executed is estimated to be around 4,000. Civilian Evacuation Evacuation and Flight of Civilians With the relocation of the capital of China and the reports of Japanese brutality, most of the civilian population fled Nanjing out of fear. Wealthy families were the first to flee, leaving Nanjing in automobiles, followed by the evacuation of the middle class and then the poor, while only the destitute lowest class such as the ethnic Tonka boat people remained behind. More than three-quarters of the population had fled Nanjing before the Japanese arrived. Massacre From December 13, 1937, the Japanese army engaged in random murder, wartime rape, looting, arson, and other war crimes. Such crime continued from three to six weeks, depending on the types of crime. The first three weeks were more intense. A group of foreign expatriates headed by Rabe had formed a 15-man international committee for the Nanking Safety Zone on November 22 and mapped out the Nanking Safety Zone in order to safeguard civilians in the city. Massacre Contest in 1937, the Osaka Mainichi Shimbun and its sister newspaper, the Tokyo Nichi Nichi Shimbun, 
covered a contest between two Japanese officers, Tosiaki Mukai and Tsuyoshi Noda of the Japanese 16th Division. The two men were described as vying to be the first to kill 100 people with a sword before the capture of Nanjing. From Jirong to Tongshen, two cities in Jiangsu Province, China, Mukai had killed 89 people while Noda had killed 78. The contest continued because neither had killed 100 people. By the time they had arrived at Zijin Mountain, Noda had killed 105 people while Mukai had killed 106 people. Both officers supposedly surpassed their goal during the heat of battle, making it impossible to determine which officer had actually won the contest. Therefore, according to journalists Asami Kazuo and Suzuki Jiro, writing in the Tokyo Nichi Nichi Shimbun of December 13, they decided to begin another contest to kill 150 people. After the surrender of Japan in 1945, Mukai and Noda were both arrested and tried as war criminals, and both of them were found guilty and executed by shooting on January 28, 1948. Evidence Collection The Japanese either destroyed or concealed important documents, severely reducing the amount of evidence available for confiscation. Between the declaration of a ceasefire on August 15, 1945, and the arrival of American troops in Japan on August 28, the Japanese military and civil authorities systematically destroyed military, naval, and government archives, much of which was from the period 1942 to 1945. Overseas troops in the Pacific and East Asia were ordered to destroy incriminating evidence of war crimes. Approximately 70% of the Japanese Army's wartime records were destroyed. In regards to the Nanjing Massacre, Japanese authorities deliberately concealed wartime records, eluding confiscation from American authorities. Some of the concealed information was made public a few decades later. For example, a two-volume collection of military documents related to the Nanjing operations was published in 1989, and disturbing excerpts from Kasego Nakajima's diary, a commander at Nanjing, was published in the early 1980s. Ono Kenji, a chemical worker in Japan, began to curate a collection of wartime diaries from Japanese veterans who fought in the Battle of Nanjing in 1937. In 1994, nearly 20 diaries in his collection were published, which became an important source of evidence for the massacre. Official war journals and diaries were also published by Kaikosha, an organization of retired Japanese military veterans. In early 1980s, after interviewing Chinese survivors and reviewing Japanese records, Japanese journalist Honda Katsuchi claimed that the Nanjing massacre was not an isolated case, and that Japanese atrocities against the Chinese were common throughout the lower Yangtze River since the Battle of Shanghai. His claims have been corroborated with the diaries of other medics and combatants who fought in China. Rape The International Military Tribunal for the Far East estimated that 20,000 women, including some children and the elderly, were raped during the occupation with Yale University claiming over 80,000 rapes. A large number of rapes were done systematically by the Japanese soldiers as they went from door to door, searching for girls, with many women being captured and gang-raped. The women were often killed immediately after being raped, often through explicit mutilation, such as by penetrating vaginas with bayonets, long sticks of bamboo, or other objects. On December 19, 1937, the Reverend James M. McCallum wrote in his diary, I know not where to end. Never I have heard or read such brutality. Rape. 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 We estimate at least 1,000 cases a night and many by day. In case of resistance or anything that seems like disapproval, there is a bayonet stab or a bullet. People are hysterical. Women are being carried off every morning, afternoon and evening. The whole Japanese army seems to be free to go and come as it pleases, and to do whatever it pleases. On March 7, 1938, Robert O. Wilson, a surgeon at the University Hospital in the safety zone administrated by the United States, wrote in a letter to his family, a conservative estimate of people slaughtered in cold blood is somewhere about 100,000, including of course thousands of soldiers that had thrown down their arms. Here are two excerpts from his letters of the 15th and the 18th of December 1937 to his family. The slaughter of civilians is appalling. I could go on for pages telling of cases of rape and brutality almost beyond belief. 
Two bayonet corpses are the only survivors of seven street cleaners who were sitting in their headquarters when Japanese soldiers came in without warning or reason and killed five of their number and wounded the two that found their way to the hospital. Let me recount some instances occurring in the last two days. Last night the house of one of the Chinese staff members of the university was broken into and two of the women, his relatives, were raped. Two girls, about 16, were raped to death in one of the refugee camps. In the university middle school where there are 8,000 people the Japs came in 10 times last night, over the wall, stole food, clothing, and raped until they were satisfied. They bayonet one little boy of eight who had a five bayonet wounds including one that penetrated his stomach. A portion of omentum was outside the abdomen. I think he will live. In his diary kept during the aggression against the city and its occupation by the Imperial Japanese Army, the leader of the safety zone, John Rabe, wrote many comments about Japanese atrocities. For December 17. Two Japanese soldiers have climbed over the garden wall and are about to break into our house. When I appear they give the excuse that they saw two Chinese soldiers climb over the wall. When I show them my party badge, they return the same way. In one of the houses in the narrow street behind my garden wall, a woman was raped and then wounded in the neck with a bayonet. I managed to get an ambulance so we can take her to Kulu Hospital. Last night up to 1,000 women and girls are said to have been raped, about 100 girls at Jinling College, alone. You hear nothing but rape. If husbands or brothers intervene, they're shot. What you hear and see on all sides is the brutality and bestiality of the Japanese soldiers. In a documentary film about the Nanjing Massacre, in the name of the emperor, a former Japanese soldier named Shiro Azuma spoke candidly about the process of rape and murder in Nanking. At first we used some kinky words like pikankin. Pi means hip, kankin means look. Pikankin means, let's see a woman open up her legs. Chinese women didn't wear underpants. Instead, they wore trousers tied with a string. There was no belt. As we pulled the string, the buttocks were exposed. We, Pekankin. We looked. After a while we would say something like, it's my day to take a bath, and we took turns raping them. It would be all right if we only raped them. I shouldn't say all right. But we always stabbed and killed them. Because dead bodies don't talk. Iris Chang, author of The Rape of Nan King, book, wrote one of the most comprehensive accounts of Japanese war atrocities in China. In her book, she estimated that the number of Chinese women raped by Japanese soldiers ranged from 20,000 to 80,000. Chang also states that not all rape victims were women. Some Chinese men were sodomized and forced to perform repulsive sex acts. There are also accounts of Japanese troops coercing families to commit incestuous acts. Sons were coerced into rape their mothers, fathers were forced to rape their daughters, and brothers were forced to rape their sisters. Instead of punishing the Japanese troops who were responsible for wholesale rape, the Japanese expeditionary force in central China issued an order to set up comfort houses during this period of time. Yoshimi Yoshiaki, a prominent history professor at Chui University, observes. Because Japan was afraid of criticism from China, the United States of America and Europe following the case of massive rapes between battles in Shanghai and Nanking. I am glad you watched the video. If you like the video, please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon. This will alert you when we release new episodes.